Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for being here to listen to me. Uh, I have to admit I've been a bit under the weather today, which is why the presentation has just arrived. Um, so if I look a bit dizzy, it's, uh, it's uh, not because I'm overwhelmed by what I'm talking about. Um, I've been studying UCG now for quite a while, um, and as a consultant, of course, we are interested in supporting commercial activity. So um, in terms of what I, consultants never come without explaining a little bit about their company. We are a, a private loan company in, in the UK. This is our 176th year. We've been working on coal all that time, and that's the sort of thing, the other things we do. This is a photograph of our original office, luckily not the current one. And, and this is where we have our offices, throughout the UK, and also in Moscow and Almaty in Kazakhstan. We work a lot in the gold mining industry, so um, Almaty is a good place to be. This is what I'm going to cover today. Um, if, we, if we're going to know where UCG is commercially, I think I'll spend a bit of time explaining to you what modern UCG looks like, uh, talk about the history, the various technologies, who is doing what, and the status of the technology. So what is UCG? Um, well, in its simplest form, it's partial oxidation of coal, a coal seam in situ. Pairs of boreholes are drilled and a connection is made between them. Oxidant uh, air or oxygen plus steam is pumped down one borehole. Coal is ignited. That sounds very similar. The coal is ignited. A, a lot of the, the skill in IP in this is in actually doing that ignition. And, and syngas, the product is syngas, not methane, flows up the second hole. What is syngas? Well, it's a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, you know, a subsidiary carbon dioxide, steam, and, and methane. If you, the oxygen is air, obviously most of it's going to be nitrogen. And the calorific value varies from about 35% of natural gas if uh, it's oxygen blown or 10% if it's air blown. So we've got syngas as a product, not methane. Um, syngas, as, as we'll hear uh, just after this talk, is, is what's used. It's called synthesis gas, really. It's, it's uh, the gases that can be used in fissure trops synthesis to form long-chain hydrocarbons. And there are many uses for syngas, again, as we'll hear later. Um, the, the simplest one, of course, is in power generation. You can generate this gas and just use it in a turbine or in gas engines. Um, but there's, of course, all this range of value-added type uh, production you can do. Um, it's a good route to hydrogen, uh, in some cases, synthetic natural gas. Uh, uh, might be a, a route to market, gas to liquids, uh, methanol derivatives, which is a very, a very common proposed route in, in China, and a, other chemical feedstock, uh, ammonia particularly. Types of reaction. When coal is heated in the, in the gasification process, there's the following reactions that occur. Well, first of all, it dries. Um, actually, this is in reverse. Uh, if you heat coal up uh, conventionally, this is what would happen. You get pyrolysis, uh, which is the carbon-carbon bonds start to break down, and you get heavy organic materials released. And then gasification. Um, near the injection well, the combustion is, is, is total. We get uh, the, the normal combustion reactions, which generates the heat to drive this reaction. The skill is in getting the right amount of oxygen down the hole, which means not too much, so that the gasification, the, the further reduction reactions take place. These are endothermic reactions. So if we look at a simplified view of a gasification chamber, where the oxygen comes in, we have very high temperatures, maybe 1,300 degrees, um, and we've got pure oxidation reactions occurring here, basically producing carbon monoxide, but mostly carbon dioxide. As 
the gas then moves across the, uh, the really charred coal, the heated char, and at these temperatures we get the reduction reactions, which is basically giving you more carbon monoxide, and importantly we're getting hydrogen as well. And in this here we get the pyrolysis type reactions. So why, and I apologise, this isn't the, the world's best illustration. What's the prize here? Why should we do it? Um, it's a security of energy supply issue. Many countries, as you know, have coal deposits that, that don't have oil and gas deposits. Uh, it, oh, apologies. It should be in more environmentally acceptable uh, use of coal. And it gives access to the 85% of coal reserves that are unavailable for commercial mining, either because they're underneath something or more commonly because they're too deep. And, and we have, as we've discussed before, the ability for, for multi-product uh, from here. These, these graphs here, this is of the reserves. Coal produce, uh, forms 64% of uh, known fossil fuel reserves, but it's estimated 95% of total resource in the ground. These are IEA clean coal research figures. Now, they may have been done before the um, rush for shale gas. I'm not that sure of it. I was just thinking that last night. What's UCG? What isn't? What is UCG not? Well, it's not an under-controlled mine fire. This is a famous Centralia mine fire in Pennsylvania, where the, the uh, mining workings close to the surface have gained access, free access to oxygen, and they'll be burning forevermore, I would think. Um, and those in the UK, the Daw Mill fire quite recently showed the, the danger of this sort of stuff. But this is only happening when it has access to oxygen. In the UCG um, world, as we see later on, we very tightly control that. What else is not? It's not coal bed methane. Um, they're very similar technologies. Coal bed methane drills holes into unmined coal seams, as UCG does. Uh, coal bed methane sometimes fracks, sometimes doesn't. Uh, UCG, you have to establish linkage between the two holes, normally and nowadays by directional drilling. And this is the main difference, is that coal bed methane has to pump out the groundwater to reduce the hydrostatic pressure. Whereas UCG, you need that groundwater to maintain a hydrostatic pressure on the gas fire. And, and also another difference, Perhaps 2 to 5% of the contained energy in the seam, <laughs> 50 to 70%. Now, that, that number is not experimentally proved or anything. It, um, it's probably more like 40% of the energy because you have to leave pillars in between the various gasification chambers. Now, that's a quick run through what UCG is, the history. Um, the first trial was in the UK, although I believe some German researchers were doing things at the same time. In the 1930s, of an intensive Soviet development, um, Joseph Stalin decided he didn't want miners going underground, so there was a lot of research into that. And then through European trials, uh, the US, in the, in the era of the, the oil shocks when all, they were doing tremendous amount of energy research, did six major trials, but over 30 trials in total. There's uh, uh, the European trial. The DTI in, in the UK had a, an initiative that ran for about two or three years, and we as a company wrote much of the documentation around about the turn of the millennium, but that ran out of steam. But from 2000 on, it's really the Australian companies that have been driving this process, and I'll explain about them later. Technologies. Uh, here's some cartoons. This, these are from CSIRO in Australia, uh, who have been a leading light in UCG uh, research. You can have vertical wells, uh, well, linked by hydraulic fractures, it says here, um, but more often by reverse combustion, which was changing the orientation of the oxygen flow. Vertical wells linked by an inseam borehole. These are, are not to scale. In a, in, are really schematic. 
Now here's we're getting into more modern um, te technologies. If we have one vertical hole and another vertical to end seam hole, the directional drilling we've been talking about, which is really what's transformed this technology as well as many other unconventional technologies, the ability to do controlled directional drilling. Um, this controlled re retraction injection point, the crypt point, is developed by Lawrence Livermore Lab in the US, and basically you can, you can create a new injection point at various points going back along the injection well by basically burning a hole in the casing. It was quite a major breakthrough. The double crip, as uh, I'll explain in more detail later on, and a variant for in situ seams. So there's a variant, um, basically we're talking here about using a vertical hole, but either with one or two directional drilling holes in seam. So, really, um, this is at the Bloodwood Creek trial site in Australia. Um, as you see, the borehole is coming into the seam and then is steered horizontally within the seam. This distance at the minute is about a kilometer. Um, they're talking about the maximum distance of these panels. Now, here's a very, very neat diagram done by Carbon Energy on their Bloodwood Creek trial site. Uh, they've done three gasifiers there. They're, what I believe, technically the most advanced company. They have two holes here. Uh, this is the, the injection hole, and this is the, the, product, the product hole, production well. And they have an ignition, single ignition well that the coal was ignited here. And then they keep the, the, the program running and they retract this flame front retracts along these boreholes till it's complete. So they, they've done, this is the third of these panels they've done with the increasing degrees of success. So, and if we look and plan on what's happening here, the airflow, the injected air and oxygen goes, they actually use enriched oxygen just to confuse matters. They use uh, air that's enriched with certain percentage of oxygen. The gasification occurs along the face here. Because this is low pressure, because we're, we're taking the gas out here, the gas tracks along the face and maintains this shape. And then they've done various geophysical tests to, to prove that the gas fire is where they think it is. Because in the other methods, nobody was really quite sure where the gas fire was, uh, where what coal was gasifying. So, Okay, now to quick gallop through the technologies. So who's doing what? There's a, a very messy map um, from the Youth Underground Coal Gasification Association that shows basically there's stuff going on all over the world. But of these, what are the important ones? Firstly, in Queensland, there have been three uh, trial sites in, in Queensland, uh, Link Energy, uh, carbon Energy and Cougar Energy. They were a, a trial program set up by the Queensland Government in face of strong opposition from the coal bed methane or coal seam gas, as they call it, their industry, because they're competing for the same resource. Now, Link Energy at Chinchilla and, and Cougar Energy at Bloodwood Creek have both been very successful. Cougar Energy um, at whatever it was called, they, their trial failed because of uh, they had benzene in one of the monitoring wells, which the state claimed wasn't there before, at, at extremely low quantities, of course. Kingaroy was the name of that site. Next, in, in China, there's a tremendous amount of activity in China, both from Chinese companies and the Australian companies going to China, and also um, some British companies, uh, companies seem well. International, who I worked with um, in China, it's a, it's a very large joint venture to gasify uh, coal in Inner Mongolia. Most of these projects are in Inner Mongolia. Um, interestingly, Hungary, uh, there's another Australian company, Wild Horse Energy, developing a project in Hungary in, in, 
in, near Pesh in southern Hungary, and uh, they may well be one of the first to actually do a, a semi-commercial project. And in South Africa, for those of you who know the energy system in South Africa, they are very, very, very short of power. And um, um, excuse me, my mind's a bit fuddled today. Um, oh, ESCOM, the big power supplier in in South Africa, has signed a joint agreement with Link, with no, not with Sasol, to develop UCG and there's some other UCG projects that hope to be up and running by 2015 in South Africa. It's uh, the main companies, as, as I say. Ergo Exergy are a, a technology company, and they were, they were involved in many of these, in this project, in that project, not in that one, but in the South African projects, technology provider, and it, that, that stemmed out of the, the only real commercial UCG project, which is in uh, Uzbekistan, at Angren, um, and the technology came out of that project, and ergo exergy people try and sell it around the world. What's happening in the UK? Well, it, it's, we have an interesting situation in the UK that there's a presumption against UCG on land, but there's a presumption for UCG offshore. Now, it's very difficult to drill uh, shut, um, small diameter directional wells offshore. But um, we have 17 coal authority licenses granted in the near shore, um, ranging from just off here in the Firth of Force, between here and Fife, down the east coast of England. And these are for all, all for offshore extensions of, of the Carboniferous, of the coal field some offshore in Wales, in the Wirral, and in the Solway, and a variety of um, different small UK, UK companies, uh, Riverside is actually an Australian company, who've done this. The, the most interesting one is, is this one in the Thames. Somebody has a conditional UCG license in the Thames, Riverside Energy, there's no known coal field there. They've, They've taken a punt on some geophysical, regional geophysical evidence, and they think there's coal there. So you can see probably this is a, a reflection of the fact that coal authority licenses are quite inexpensive, <laughs> rather than, I believe, a, a real economic potential. So what's the status of the technology? We've seen this technology. It's been around for 100 years. Uh, we have good knowledge of, of where coal is. Um, so why is it not being rolled out? Well, this is one reason, I guess. Um, there's a substantial anti-coal um, lobby, political, uh, public, you name it. Um, you know, it's coal is not seen as the fuel of the future, it's seen as the fuel of the past. <coughs> but what's the status? I mean, it depends who you're talking to. This is a guy, Gordon Cooch, who used to work for the IEA Clean Coal Centre, who I knew personally. And he, just before he retired, he did a study of UCG. And he said this, that basically, although we've had 50 years, 50 years of uh, trials, it, you know, nothing's really happened. He, he can't see things being commercial. And, but they could be commercial in five to seven years. So that would, I guess, be 2014 to 2016. Now, I came across this press release, which was last week from, from Carbon Energy in Australia. Um, so basically they're saying, they're declaring their um, Bloodwood Creek project commercial. So that, and um, they could, they're, they're on a basis of coal to ammonia um, and, and synthetic natural gas. That, there's all sorts of predictions, of course, of the cost of this. And, and really, being an embryonic technology, I've stuck it, stood away from them because people generally prove what they want to prove, if, that, if that's not being too cynical. But you don't know what you don't know. That's been the main problem. Financing of UCG projects has been very difficult. Um, industry norms will be needed in the development of UCG. 
much needs to be known before UCG is just another financeable mining method. And of course, companies have a vested interest in not, not making that information available uh, because they want to generate the most profit from their IP. But we've really got to share information on this technology to move it all forward. Some issues, I mean, obviously, and everyone's not rosy. What's the issues of concern with UCG? Um, well, we have a chemical, we have a gasification reaction under the ground. So there is potential for chemical contamination. It's a key factor. Um, and for this reason, we, you must gasify at less than the hydrostatic pressure so that water inflow is always into the chamber. Um, and for this reason, depth, depth is, very, is good. Once you get to a certain depth, as you all know, uh, the aquifers are just about dominantly saline and not used for human or animal consumption. So depth is good. And we need, of course, we need uh, a track record in this. Both Link and Carbon Energy say they can shut down a gas fire and return um, uh, pollution levels to, to the background very easily. But, you know, we need to pers persuade people of that. And as I say, the Kingaroy trial closure hasn't helped this industry. Uh, subsidence, we're mining coal, but by a different method, so we have a subsidence effect. Um, conventional wisdom is it's just like an underground coal mine, but nobody's quite sure what the heat does. The trial sites in Australia have no subsidence. Angren has no subsidence. Um, but work is continuing to, to with um, researchers continue on this. And again, depth is good. The further deeper you are, you know, the less likely you are to have surface effects. And again, sharing of uh, results will help track record in this. Interesting, we have a, a large fractured zone here above the, where we've taken the coal out. And there's been a lot of thought whether this could be a good carbon caption, a good carbon storage target. So research is going on in that. Combined UCG and carbon storage projects are uh, going on now. Uh, public perception, of course, is an issue. Um, will this be the acceptable face of coal mining? Some people, there's no acceptable face of coal mining. Um, from my long background in the coal industry, um, I don't think it was that unacceptable anyway, but that's uh, an, old, an old sort of talking. And there's a problem in overcoming an anti-coal sentiment. Carbon capture and storage implications. Can we store the, the carbon generated back in the, in the strata it came from, that would be great if we could. Um, like in all um, energy matters, the, the <laughs> lack of knowledge of the fundamentals of energy amongst policy and opinion makers, we all have to face that, whether we're nuclear, renewable, fossil fuel, whatever. And the public perception, perception you know, Numbi, not under my backyard, comes into this. So we need to engage the, the public early and positively. And we have to get rid of the perception of an underground coal fire. So the conclusion. So in answer, what is the current state of UCG as a commercial technology? Uh, we have the potential to extract very large amounts of energy from currently economic coal seams, but several as aspects technology need to be more widely, un widely understood before it can be fully considered a commercial and financial technology. But it's close, is, is, is my view on this. It's close, and if Link Energy and Carbon Energy actually do commercial projects, and Wild Horse Energy in Hungary, uh, that, you know, that's the proof. So, that's the end of my talk. <laughs>